You I see. Freedom of people of Hell yeah. Freedom of people of need. Yeah, yeah. Freedom of people of want. Freedom of people of need. Yeah, yeah. Freedom of people of want. Freedom of people of need. Yeah, yeah. Freedom of people of want. Freedom of people of need. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Real man and road, now about wolf in a tree grand and road, now about down to no demon and road, you I see when you see man and road, me say yeah, real man and road, now about wolf in a tree grand and road, now about down to no demon and road, you I see when you see man and road, ready if you broke every chain, that when you free up the people, every day, Jamaica member you ever great, I feel burn up the fire upon every snake. Even though we know the end result If them could have killed with them catch we and hang we know No force no courage and me freedom in a step No one feel rap we and kill we and feel them and go make it out You not see the leeches You not see the hands of the devil when him sleep with You not see the leeches You not see the hands of the devil when him sleep with yeah. Real man and road Now about wolf in our Sorry guys, <laughs> I was muted. All right guys, welcome, welcome. Um, welcome to another episode of UIC Liberty TV. I have a very special show for you tonight. Um, yes, um, you're hearing me now? Are you guys hearing me now, loud and clear? Yes, all right, great. All right, so we're just gonna go through, let's see who's here, Royal Justice, let's go, UIC forever. Cool guy, respect Supreme TV. Yes, respect. Uh, hail all uniters, cool guy. Bless up, cool guy. Lion rules the jungle without fear, always here. <laughs> you see what I did there? <laughs> Bless up, lion rule the jungle, always on time and always supporting. JMH, good night, uniters. Uh, Royal Justice, no voice, no voice. Okay. Right, so tonight. Tonight we have a special show for you, and we're going to be talking about the deception that's happening um, with the government and the PSOJ. Um, you see, what, what's been happening is the two political parties have been using crime as a political fall to score points, but their leadership has expensive security systems and personal bodyguards that are paid for by us the taxpayers who are suffering the consequences of their bad governance but it's not only the commissioner or commissioner or the minister that needs to change it's the system and those who have maintained it including the psoj the jlp and the pnp tonight we're going to show you how the system of governance is a allowing for collusion between the political parties and the PSOJ oligarchy and how we, the UIC, will change it. Remember, guys, to like, share, and, of course, comment on, on our YouTube streams. Um, it's very important that you do so. We need as many people um, hearing about the, the movement. We need as many people logging on and getting um getting involved with the movement as many as possible it's very important that we do so so we need your help um so what our system of governance what is our system of governance in terms of jamaica's system of governance what is it uh we have what they call our system of governance is what you call a constitutional monarchy and I'm gonna share with you a video that basically goes through what our system of governance is and how, it, how it's permeating 
our system and how it's allowing collusion and, and, and corruption to be rife in our system. Basically, what we're seeing now, in terms of the Jamaica that we're seeing now, is a result of, you know, 78 years of this. But I'm going to show a video now. And let's see. Yep. All right. You should be able to see that. All right. Now, no. what are we going to do This is what we're going to do a big system that has three other players sitting at the top of that system. It's a colonial constitution that seeks to devalue us, dehumanize us, and make us the unsure and unaware and unprepared for who we are and who we should be. And so we have the Queen of England sitting at the top of the current constitution, not the people, not your individual sovereignty, but her sovereignty and we as her subjects, even if we don't speak in those terms daily, we live those terms by the way our system operates. That system allows the people to vote, but it's a fake vote. They're voting for MPs based on the system having divided them into two tribes to fight each other for scarce benefits and spoils. They trick us by having those two parties being privately funded behind the scenes in order to sell us a lie, advertise to us, market to us, and even give us some handouts so that we go to the polls and legitimize their system of fraud. It's a fraud, it's a trick, and it has been very destructive. And they have, they have actually tricked us into thinking that we have a so-called democracy and that we really have a say and that we're the ones guiding the process with our votes. No. You don't have a democracy, you don't have the freedom to, to vote if somebody else determines who your options are. So they have determined your options, the nominees, and place them in front of you, and then tell you that you have a choice. That's not a choice, that's dictatorship, disguised as democracy. Now in that system, they lead us to elect 63 members of parliament, 63 members of parliament at the constituency level. The leader of the winning party becomes the prime minister. And the second person, the leader of the party that comes in second, is the leader of the opposition. And notice what they have those two people do. The prime minister, he appoints 13 of the 21 senators, and the opposition leader appoints the other eight. What this does, it ensures that the senators cannot think independently because they are appointed by the prime minister and the opposition leader. They become rubber stampers for their parties and for their party leadership. So they're not true legislators. They're not true men and women representing the interests of the Jamaican people. They're representing the interests of those who appointed them and the parties to which they belong. The 63 MPs are similarly tainted because each and every one of those MPs, together with the 21 senators, are looking for a ministerial appointment by the sitting government, the sitting prime minister, or later by the leader of the opposition should their party become elected. This means that your MPs are tainted. They're not there to represent the people. They're there to represent the party, and they're there to represent their own personal interests. And so they will not challenge the prime minister, whether from the Senate or from the House of Representatives. And the prime minister, will not challenge the PSOJ and others because he's funded by them and his party is funded by them. And so the end result is you have an executive branch, this little green box here in the middle, the executive branch, the cabinet, is made up of the PM appointing partisan MPs and senators to sit as ministers. These persons may have no competence at all in the job that they're holding. They're there at the pleasure of the prime minister. He can hire them and fire them at will. But the system is so designed that he must pick them from the House of Parliament and from the Senate, which is diabolical because it leaves the country with politicians looking after the administrative affairs of the country and they may or may not be qualified to do so. 
The prime minister then controls the Senate and he also controls the House of Representatives and he also controls the executive, which makes him extremely powerful and is really a form of dictatorship um, disguised as a democracy. He also controls the judiciary, which is the bottom green box here, by way of the way we appoint judges. Uh, so he similarly influences the appointment of judges, the way he influences the appointment of ministers. Okay, so very, very important video there. I hope you guys understood what was being said. Um, so what we are seeing is basically our system of governance. And we saw where the queen is our head of state. And then we are now under, and beneath the queen, you have the, um, the political parties that are funded by both by the PSOJ. So both political parties are funded by the PSOJ. And, but we're also seeing that the PM has ultimate power. And that's why you see so many politicians dreaming of becoming the next prime minister, because with that power, I mean, there's so much that you can do. Um, and so where does the PSOJ, PSOJ fit in to all of this? The PSOJ, as was said in the video, is basically the funder of these two parties. So they are funding the political parties. Actually, in the last elections, um, they funded the two political parties to the tune of 300 million Jamaican dollars. And that's just during the election campaign period. Uh, we don't know how much was being fund has been funded outside of that, but for the election period, 300 million Jamaican dollars. So they are privately funding these two parties. And these two parties are now using that funding to go out and get votes, right? And so when whichever party wins, they are now beholden to the PSOJ, right? So this system has been going on for years. In fact, since independence, we've kept the system right and um it it really leads to corruption collusion and deception because what happens is the political parties go out they have all this money to spend right and they're able to buy you know hats t-shirts pins um food for people um and these are just the, the people that, that are going to vote for them right and when they win now, they're now able to present policies or put forward policies that benefit the people that funded them for the elections, right? And so this is a, this is a, 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 a serious situation that's been happening for the last 78 years. Also, what we see is political games being played between both sides. So the opposition, or whichever party is in opposition will now chide the government for failing at what they failed to do when they were in power, right? Um, where, where just recently I, I, I saw where um, a past prime minister was saying, you know, how Jamaica has not grown much in the last 60 years. And, you know, and I saw another past prime minister saying, if, you know, he should have taken us, made us a republic when he was in and I'm saying, yeah, well, why didn't you, you know? Um, so we have a lot of that going on where it's just, you know, to create this kind of aura of almost like they know it all now that they, they, they've been through it and they know it. But the question is, if you were in there, why didn't you do it when you were in there, right? So rather the opposition, accusing the government or chiding the government for not doing what they should have done or they failed to do. And then mixed up in all of that, we have the media who is owned 
by the PSOJ oligarchs, <laughs> right? They are now only showing what the opposition or what the opposition's response is to anything. So when the PNP is in power and certain policies are put in place, you know, the, the, the media houses will go to the JLP and, you know, find out what is the JLP's take on it. Uh, when the JLP is in power, the media houses will go to the PNP to find out what is the PNP's take on, you know, what the government is doing. But you'll never hear about the UIC, and there's a reason for that. You'll never hear what is the UIC's take on particular policies and plans, you know, announcements that were made um, by the governing party or by the ruling party. Um, because the POC, PSOJ is really happy with what's going on. It benefits them, right? They're funding these two parties. Doesn't matter who wins, JLP or PNP, it's still benefiting them, right, at the end of the day. And they're able to do and move in ways that they want to, while we, the people, are suffering at the, at the hands of our political parties, or our government, I should say. So their aim is to get people to always vote JLP and PNP. They don't want UIC, they don't want a third party. In fact, um, in 2018, I believe, uh, the, the policies or the, 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 they changed the regulations for political parties in Jamaica. And so we, before that, anybody could have started a political party and there were no regulations and et cetera. In 2018, they decided to um, set up these regulations. And the UIC at the time um, applied to become a registered political party and was fought tooth and nail for 10 months. Drag out the system, drag it out, drag it out as long as they could. And um, finally, we were able to get um, registration. We were registered, officially registered as Jamaica's third political party. As it, is, as it stands right now, there's no more NDM, there's no PPP. All other third parties have been nullified, right, because of those regulations. And there's a reason for that. They just want the people to be focused on JLP and PNP. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to focus on, JLP and PNP. And when JLP get them time, don't worry, PNP, you're going to get your time. Five, ten years down the line, you'll get your time. PNP time come, don't worry, JLP, you'll get your time. It doesn't matter who wins. It benefits the POSOJ all the time. Now, the UIC has been exposing this deception from day one. One of the first things I remember hearing from the UIC is this very same thing, a change of system. We need to change our system of governance. And now we're hearing the POC, PS, PSOJ trying to change their tune, right? So they're trying to fix up their image a bit. They don't want to look like the, the dictators or the oligarchs. And so I'm going to play a video for you that shows um how the POSOJ is trying to shift their image you know um to play as if you know we really care about the people and we want to get involved in the communities and so let me play a video for you that shows you that all right Come back, come back to Prime, Prime News, and a special, and a special welcome, welcome once again, again to those, those of you watching Once All Media, media dot com. The private, the private sector organization of Jamaica is increasing the pressure on local politicians to find solutions to the crime problem in the country. On Sunday, the PSOJ's leadership demanded the PNP and the JLP unite on the issue to help stop the bloodletting. We have more in this report from Cody and Barrett. President of the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica, PSOJ, Keith Duncan, said trust had broken down between the two main political parties on measures to fight crime. Mr. Duncan cited the dispute over the use of states of public emergency as example of the divide between the parties on the issue of crime. He warned that the country could face a crisis. 
and therefore urged the government and opposition to meet to discuss crime fighting. These SOEs were supposed to be uh, upgraded into the, what we call the Enhanced Security Measures Act. And uh, this is where we think the government of Jamaica and the opposition really need to sit down and work that through because this is what will deal with the, long, the short term containment of crime. And uh, uh, this has been outstanding for some time. And we believe that if there is a meeting of the mind, that there can be alignment around. I'm News and a special welcome once again to those of you watching on OneSpotMedia.com. The private sector organization of Jamaica is increasing the pressure on local politicians to find solutions to the crime problem plaguing the country. On Sunday, the PSOJ's leadership demanded the PNP and the JLP unite on the issue to help stop the bloodletting. We have more in this report from Cody and Barrett. President of the private sector organization of Jamaica, PSOJ, Keith Duncan, said trust had broken down between the two main political parties on measures to fight crime. Mr. Duncan cited the dispute over the use of states of public emergency as example of divide between the parties on the issue of crime. He warned that the country could face a crisis and therefore urged the government and opposition to meet to discuss crime fighting. These SOEs were supposed to be uh, upgraded into the, what we call the Enhanced Security Measures Act. And uh, this is where we think the government of Jamaica and the opposition really need to sit down and work that through because this is what will deal with the, the short-term containment of crime. And uh, th this has been outstanding for some time. And we believe that if there is a meeting of the mind, that there can be alignment around these short-term crime containment strategies. Mr. Duncan also warned that Jamaicans are looking on, hoping for a positive outcome, and they will judge the politicians on the issue. Last week, the PSOJ launched Project STAR to fund social projects in the most volatile communities in Jamaica. A total of 20 communities will benefit. Downtown Kingston, Savannah Lamar in Westmoreland, and Maypen in Clarendon will be the first areas to benefit from the multi-million dollar initiative. They, it would look at the infrastructure of the community they, uh, they, in terms of the, the, the housing, in terms of the street light, in terms of internet of availability. But the program is driven by, it's evidence-based data-driven, and it's driven by um, the data that we use to determine which communities are crime data, that is murder, shootings that have been reported into the police, and secondly, violence-related um, injuries that really are reported only to the hospitals because this is where you see the, um, where you will see that it's almost like a leading indicator of violence to come. Cody and Barrett for TVJ News. Okay, so there you have it. The POSOJ is now trying to do social work. In, in our communities. Um, so we saw in the video where they launched a project called Project STAR. And basically this project is an in initiative that is supposed to um, fund social projects in 20 volatile communities around the island. Um, but Something very important was said there. It's a multi-million dollar initiative. Where's that money coming from? That's a question. Like when I heard that, I'm like, okay, so where's the money? Where's that money coming from? Where is it coming from? Well, we're gonna try and and and, and flesh that out tonight. Um, so multi-million dollar initiative to fund social projects in 20 volatile communities in Jamaica. And also, these projects have to do with infrastructure. So we're talking about housing, we're talking about um, street lights, internet. These are things that the UIC has been saying for a while that these are, you know, these are things that every community should have. You know, we should have proper garbage collection in our communities. We should have street lights and sidewalks, you know. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it is piggybacking on some of the ideas and the policies and the concepts that we're, we have and using them as talking points, right? So where is that money coming from? That, 20, that million, multi-million dollar 
um, or multi millions of dollars that they're putting for this initiative. Well, I have a, I have a, a what should I call it? I have an idea. Um, there's something called concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. This is a concept where government, the ruling government, will put policies in place that will benefit special interest groups, right? Special interest groups that will benefit these people. And so they're benefiting from all the policies that are put in place. But then the, the, the cost of this program or this policy is dispersed throughout the population or throughout the, you know, the taxpayers, etc. So as a taxpayer, you're not seeing much of a cost because if it's spread out or across you know, a million, two million people, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. But you're not benefiting. The benefit is really going to these special interest groups. And so some of that money is what's being used here. This is my, you know, my opinion, right? Um, but another thing that was very important in the video was when Mr. Duncan said that you know, these talks are breaking down and he wants them to come together because these talks are supposed to um, bring some short-term containment to the crime issues, not long-term containment. We're not trying to solve crime here. We just want to contain it for a short term, right? And of course, the cost is bad roads, bad schools, bad hospitals, bad crime management, just bad governance overall, right? So what is the UIC's position and plan on all of this, right? Um, I'm gonna play another section of the video that you just watched with Mr. Patterson. And he's going to explain, he's going to break down the UIC's system of governance and what we are proposing, what we will do when we become um, the next government. So take a listen and we'll come back. Moving right, right along, along, the UIC has taken the opportunity to spend the last 10 years or so developing a much better system of governance, which is not only good for Jamaica, but it's good for the world. It's good for any country, but very focused first on Jamaica. In this model, at the very top, we put the constitution, the rule of law. So you're not being ruled by a queen of England. You're being ruled by just laws. And those laws, are based on the idea that each of you are sovereign, so the people are sovereign. And the system of election is such that we are non-partisan. We use a publicly funded campaign system that will give every single candidate equal access to what they need to run. So whether you're poor or you're rich, you'll be able to offer yourself to serve your country and not be placed at a disadvantage because of either money or the control of special interest groups. Now, the people will directly elect a president instead of a prime minister who comes from being leader of a party, who comes from back to the hills and whatever. We're going to elect our own president nationally. We're also going to elect three vice presidents, one for each county. So the people in Cornwall, which includes Westmoreland, Trelawney, Annaval, uh, St. Elizabeth and St. James, they would select one person to be their um, to go to the executive branch as their representative at the county level. The people of Middlesex, which includes Manchester, Clarendon. Um, I phone so I can hear. I'm still, I'm using my computer. I'm watching the screen from my computer. Could you, could you please mute yourself, Mr. Jarrett? You're coming through loud and clear. All right. So the VP from the VP for Middlesex will be elected by the county of Middlesex, uh, which includes Manchester, Clarendon, St. Anne, St. Mary, uh, and who am I missing? Not sure who I just missed. Um, and, and Catherine, if I, if I didn't say that. 
and the VP for Story will be elected elected by the parishes of Story, which would be Kingston, St. Andrew, St. Thomas, and Portland. These two combined will, will form the executive branch of the government. Uh, the president, when he or she is elected, would run with two running mates. One will be the general secretary, the person who's going to be chief of staff, and one will be treasury secretary, the person who will be minister of finance. So we the people get to vet those two persons running with, with the president to see if they are competent and qualified to serve in those capacities. Together, the president and the three vice presidents and these two persons would then nominate the persons who are now going to sit as ministers of government. And they can only nominate persons who are qualified to serve. And those persons cannot be either in the House of Representatives or in the Senate. Unlike the old system, we're going to elect senators. So all, we're going to have 14 instead of 21 senators, and all 14 will be elected one per parish. So now you're going to have proper parish representation in the senators, proper county representation in the VPs. And at the community level, we're going to elect the House of Representatives, and those persons must live in the community that they seek to represent. So gone would be the days when somebody from Kingston is representing St. Elizabeth or anything like that. So now you're going to have true representatives. The, the executive branch will only be able to nominate ministers of government. They cannot appoint them like the situation is now where the prime minister appoints. Instead, they will nominate these persons and the Senate will vet them publicly, interview them in a public space in the Senate, uh, televised, you'll be able to see clearly who these persons are, what their credentials are, you'll see them answering questions and see whether or not they're fit for the role. The Senate will then make a recommendation to the House and the House will vote up or down, whether to accept or to reject the person in question. Once this person is elected, they cannot be removed from office by the President or the Executive Branch unless they go through the same process. This will ensure that we have men and women in ministerial positions who are not afraid of the president or afraid of the executive, that they're going to be dismissed because they won't toe the line. These men and women are going to be professionals who know their trades, who understand their, their roles, and can stand up to anyone, any president, any executive, and can also represent themselves fully to the Jamaican people on the issues. This will ensure continuity, it will ensure competence, it will ensure that we make good decisions uh, for the nation from the executive side. And those will be vetted by the House of Rep, who are not commingled, and the Senate, which is not commingled. In the current system, we have senators who are also ministers of government. We have House of Representative members who are also ministers of government. You have a prime minister who is a part of the, the legislature. That is too convoluted, and it does not allow for proper checks and balances. We are fixing that with this system. Similarly, the, the judiciary will be nominated and uh, elected through a similar process, which ensures that our judges are not conflicted and our, um, the rest of our public sector is not conflicted in terms of how they serve the people of the world. So that outlines for you how we're going to change things. Right now, the colonial masters sit at the top. They establish global rules to enrich themselves at our expense. They work through the private sector organization of Jamaica, as well as through the two parties, the city arrows. They work through the two parties. They also work through mainstream media. By offering money, they can buy our media and tell our media what to, to tell us. So the mainstream media is controlled by the CM, that's the colonial master, the PSOJ oligarchs who own the media platform, because remember, they own these things, right? And the GLP and BNP, who is a part of the club. So the mainstream media is controlled right now. The social media is controlled right now by the, the CM, the colonial masters, and the PSOG organization. And the GLP and BNP are controlled by the PSOG. This, all of these now shape the people of Jamaica. They divide the people. 
they distract the people, they deceive the people, they give them false options. And the sole purpose of all of this is so that they can extract the wealth of the people, keeping us in a form of slavery while pretending that they love and care for the poor. The UIC fixes this with a 100% publicly funded, nonpartisan system of campaign financing. When we are elected, all candidates must enroll in a good governance program trial. They must complete a good governance certificate, certification program to show that they understand how government should operate and how to maintain a system of good governance. Their studies will include civics, history, economics, statistics, and communication. Once they have proven themselves ready to serve, they must go into their communities and secure voter commitments in order to qualify. So that they can do that by going door to door. Once they have their numbers of electors, they will receive eco, newspaper, radio, TV, and internet publicity. They will also receive equal access to public debates and town halls. Every word that they say will be publicly vetted and fact checked by a qualified committee of auditors. Once they have done that, the citizens will be able to vote with confidence after seeing the results of each candidate. The candidates need to achieve a simple majority of votes casted in their respective divisions or seats or ridings to be elected. This method is going to ensure that Jamaican people finally have quality candidates, quality representatives, competent persons, and a system of election that is free and fair and allows whether the person is rich or poor to have equal opportunity to be elected to serve their people. In summary, the UIC system does this. We will ensure the head of state is a real Jamaican, which is our president. That is going to ensure real independence. The current system has a foreign head of state, which is fake independence. We will ensure that the head of state and head of government is one position that's less costly. We don't need two. The current system has two for show and to create all kinds of obfuscation and deceptions. We will ensure the people directly elect their president as head of state and government. Currently, party insiders decide who can be prime minister or head of government. The UIC will ensure the people of each parish gets to elect their own independent senators. In the current system, two major party leaders get to appoint rubber stamp senators. In our system, the president nominates qualified persons, Senate vets those persons, and the House votes to confirm or reject those persons. In the colonial way, the PM appoints whomever he wishes as minister of having to justify the appointment and they remove him. In our system, MPs and senators are not allowed to serve as ministers of government. This avoids the conflict of interest. In the current system, MPs and senators are allowed to serve as ministers of government, creating conflict of interest and many, many opportunities for corruption. In our system, MPs are nominated by the constituents and not by a party. In the current system, MPs are selected by party hierarchy or delegates instead of the people of the constituency. In our system, it is 100% publicly funded, which ensures a fair and economical system and of course, it moves out all of the potential for violence and all kinds of stuff. In the current system, big money determines who has the advantage. It is unfair, it is costly, and can be quite violent as well. Our UIC is structured like this. The president, right now, this is the UIC structure. The president who, in the current system, if, if elected, will become our prime minister, initially, until we change the system. He is supported by a chairman who advises him and ensures that the NEC runs effectively. He's also supported by a treasurer, a general secretary, other directors with specific portfolios or directors without portfolio. The president's cabinet, which are persons who are potentially slated to head up different ministries under the old system before we move to the new. All of these make up the national executive, including the three vice presidents for Cornwall, Middlesex, and Surrey. Then we have parish managers. All 14 parish managers are potential senators, 
order the old system once we're elected. We also have constituency managers. These are the persons who will run as MP candidates in the next general election. And then we have division managers or councillor candidates who will serve um, as councillors if elected at the parish level. And under them, you have PD supervisors, the persons who ignore that we have proper um, election machinery in each of the polling divisions across the country, a total of about almost 7,000 of those. Um, what else can I tell you? I won't go there. All right, so very, very detailed uh, presentation there by Mr. Patterson. And it showed us, you know, how the UIC really took the time to sit down and craft a system of governance that will benefit not just the small man if he, want, he or she wants to um, be part of the, the uh, political agenda, but also benefiting the wider community, the wider Jamaica. So we're seeing how the, 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 elect, the, the, the electoral system will be publicly funded. There, no, there will be no more private special interest groups funding particular candidates or particular parties. There won't be any parties in, with the UIC government. It's a non-partisan um, constitutional republic. We see where the, the, all the positions in, 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 in the executive and in government are really being voted on by the people of Jamaica. So no longer will you have a prime minister that just because the MPs or the MPs in his party won most of the seats, he or she will become prime minister. We're going to have people directly voting for or, um, or president who is the head of state. We also have people in our various, in the various um, counties directly voting for their VPs. We'll have people directly voting for their senators, directly voting for their representatives, right? So we have a system that really has all the checks and balances against collusion and corruption. Right? We no longer have big money, you know, whoever has the most money is able to come out on top or is able to have the edge. Everyone will have equal access, every representative, every VP that's, go that's vying for the position, every senator will have equal access to newspaper ads, radio, TV, um, social media. You know online right so we're going to have a completely 100 percent funded um election campaign and so these are the things that we have we put in place to really help to, to to move jamaica forward we've looked at you know what's been going on for the last 78 years and we've realized that there are some things that aren't working we've realized that um really and truly the leaders didn't take the time out to really craft anything that will benefit the country. They just really wanted to benefit themselves, right? And so we, the UIC, came up with this um, system of governance, non-partisan constitutional republic. So that is our presentation. I saw some comments coming through in the chat. Um, Mr. Patterson is behind the scenes. I don't know he, if he wants to add anything um, to the presentation, uh, but I'm just going to go through and see what I can pick out in terms of questions or comments. Uh, okay, so I'm just so past. I guess that's pissed, pissed off at a lot of greedy people in Jamaica, and so many are feeling it now. That's Alan Scott, 100% right, brother. 
Um, we're putting plans in place to boost this party. I love UIC for what it stands for. Give me a reason to fight for Jamaica. Yes. And um, that's the whole point. Uh, I think we've, as a nation, we've gotten to the point where we are almost uh, apathetic to, 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 to where Jamaica is going. We, we no longer want to fight. And this is, this is a nation that, you know, in, in the 90, early 1900s and 1800s as well, I mean, we had so many uprisings. We had so many people, you know, fighting for what they believed in. And now we've become a people that are just so um, blasé, for want of a better word. All right, so a question here is, so if Mr. Patterson wins, how would he work around all of this? Uh, Mr. Patterson, you want, to, you want to take that one? I think you're muted. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Douglas Harper, for the great work you're doing on this presentation. So the question is, how would we get around this? Because it's not if I win, it's if we win. If we, the people of Jamaica, wins, because this will be the first time, you know, in the history of Jamaica, that we, the people, would have won. All the other time is somebody else winning, uh, except for us. So if we, the people, were to win, how would we get around what Mr. Harper just presented by the system of governance that was uh, presented? And I know the video was a little bit muffled, so um, maybe I should... Uh, try Mr. Harper to um, maybe just, um, I don't know, uh, look at those slides again, maybe. What do you think? Sure. Um, okay, let me, let me try. Yeah, can you see, can you see them? Can you see it? Yes, yes, we're seeing it. All right. So, um, uh, it's not the greatest, is it? Let me let me just um, hide this here. Uh, so if, if you look at the screen on my screen here, what I did in the first instance and uh, was to just lay out how the current system is structured. And if you look carefully at it, you'll notice that the way the system is structured, first of all, the Queen of England is at the top and the constitution is designed to achieve her objective or the objective for the system that she represents. Remember, the Queen of England represents a system of slavery, the system of colonization, the system of subjugation, the, the system of telling the rest of the world that some of us are more sovereign than others. Some of us have the right to be at the top of others and others must be our subjects. So that's what she represents. And our leaders, when they crafted our con constitution or accepted the constitution given to them, they accepted that premise. And even today, in all of their rituals, the Queen of England is at the top of that um, system. The people are only voting to legitimize that system. So the people here are an afterthought. They're really there just to create um, le legitimacy. So they control the people by dividing them into parties and then having those two parties be funded by the same source. And that singular source that's funding the party now um, uh, gets to determine who will really win, meaning which of the two options they give you will win. They give you the, the money to them. So no matter who wins, they're in control. Now, if you look at how the system is corrupted, it gives the prime minister a lot of power. First of all, the prime minister is the person which is elected by the party that wins the election. So the party machinery elects him. But that party machinery is normally controlled by the money interest. So they decide who becomes the leader of the party and therefore who becomes prime minister if the party should win. That person now who is in the pockets of those money, the interest, he is powerful because of two things. Well, three things. One, he is in charge of the executive branch of government. But he also controls the majority in the House 
of representatives because all of those MPs in the House are begging and wishing and hoping that he will appoint them as a minister of government, which would give them more status and more money. So he controls them by virtue of that design. Then he also controls the Senate because he is able to nominate and appoint through the governor general 13 members of the Senate, which gives them an automatic majority in the Senate. So the prime minister controls the senators. The senators also are hoping that the prime minister will appoint them to a ministerial portfolio. So they all have to be on their best behavior unless they have something on the prime minister in order for him to be able to give them a ministerial position. And remember, when he appoints ministerial positions, he does so without anybody uh, guiding him. He decides who he wants to, to put there. Of course, those who own him financially will be able to tell him, put this person, don't put that person, and so on. But outside of that, he is fully in charge and can hire and fire at will without any checks or balance, without any processes. Uh, he just does that. So that's enormous power. So if you think about it, in a government like this one, the prime minister controls the lower house, which is the house of representative, and he controls the upper house, which is the Senate, and he controls the executive branch of government, which is all the ministries that deals with all aspects of our lives, healthcare, education, housing, transportation, construction, all the stuff that affects us. So this one position has enormous power and he's backed by some very powerful money, the interest who also controls him. Similarly, the leader of opposition is in the pockets of the big donors because if he doesn't do what they want, his party will not get its, its allotment of funds to run in the next election. So his hands are tied. He has to do what the powers tell him. Likewise, he controls the majority, sorry, the minority in the House and the minority in the Senate by being able to appoint them. And they're hoping that should he be elected, when he becomes prime minister, he will give them plump positions, which will give them positions of power and access to do what they want to do and make money from the corruption. So the leader of opposition is also powerful within his sphere, while the prime minister is the most ultimately powerful. This entire system is designed to encourage, therefore, corruption. And that's why Jamaica is, is always in the grips of corruption. In fact, all countries which follows this method suffers from severe corruption, depending on when they implement this system. Now, the old countries like France and England and so on they did not implement this system until after the country has become rich and so on. We in Jamaica, like many other colonial countries, implemented this system from the get-go. And if you notice, almost all of the countries that have implemented this have suffered tremendously, Jamaica being among the worst. A country like Singapore chose not to go this path and made some quick changes to this very system that was handed to them and therefore prevented the country from going the, the way of Jamaica. Notice that in this whole process, both the judiciary and uh, the, the House of, or the legislature and the executive branch are compromised by this uh, design. Now let me quickly move to the UIC model. Um, how the UIC models, uh, model differs tremendously from what the um, the the current system is in Jamaica. We, as the Harper pointed out to you earlier on, put the rule of law at the top. So you can have one of two things. You can have either the rule of men or the rule of law. What we have in Jamaica today is the rule of men or whims. So Jamaica's, Jamaica cannot know exactly where we're going because it, it waves to and fro based on what flavor you have in the government. So you ha you'll have the Porsche Simpson flavor, you'll have the Michael Manley flavor, you'll have the Siaga flavor, you'll have the Andrew flavor, you'll have the Bruce Golden flavor. In the new law, the new constitution of Jamaica that we're going to bring in, you won't have those flavors. What you're going to have is one very strict system that says we're going to be ruled by laws that respect our individual sovereignty 
And so it doesn't matter who we elect, they cannot mess with our fundamental rights and freedom. So our life, liberty, and property rights will be fixed and permanent and entrenched in the Constitution. However, the people must engage in democratic discussions and actions on other matters about how you, what, what things you want to do outside of messing with people's rights and freedoms. So that now comes to the people having their direct election. What the UIC has done, we recognize that in a partisan system, you create a problem when you divide people along tribal lines as opposed to unite them around good governance. So we have designed a model which will unite people around good governance. So we say a non-partisan constitutional republic, and to make that happen, we're going to have to make sure big money cannot control our politics. So we make sure we have a 100% publicly funded system of governance, 100% electoral process. What does this mean? It means when it comes to election, every single Jamaican who wants to run for office will have an equal opportunity to run for office and not be marginalized or sidelined because they're poor or because they're not willing to follow what the money, the interest might want them to follow. Our system treats all candidates equally, and I'll explain more about that later on. But right now, at this level, the people get to vote directly for their leader. Who do they want to be the president or the leader of the executive branch of their government? We, the people, will elect a president in a national election, as opposed to what we have now, where party insiders get to decide who and the money the interests get to decide who. We will have three vice presidents, as Mr. Harper explained, one for each county, elected by the people of those counties. We will have 63 or whatever number we decide in terms of representatives, but they will be nominated and elected at the community level and must live in that community. And the reason for this is we don't want people representing people, but don't live with those people and share the same experience and concerns as those people. So you must live where you're going to represent. Similarly, the senators will no longer be rubber stamps that represent the interests of the prime minister or the opposition leader. They will, in fact, be elected by their parish 100% to represent the interest of their parish. So look what we have done with this model. We have now created a model that must work for the people. Look at it carefully. The senators, because they're not beholden to the president and not controlled by the president and not controlled by the party, they know that they can freely stand up for the interest of their parish. Similarly, the members of the House of Representatives, because they are not beholden to the president and they don't need to depend on any party and they're not controlled by any special interest group by their money, they too can fully represent the interest of their community. And guess what? They must do that because in the next election, they won't be able to hide behind the money of their party or the PSOJ oligarchy. They won't be able to slide into office because their party is elected. They're going to have to stand on their own two feet based on their performance in their constituencies. Likewise, the president can't hide behind nothing. He is going to have to face the people in a direct national election and can't hide behind party and can't get, get to office because the majority of MPs in his party won. He has to win in his own right. Same way for the vice presidents. They have to win in their own right. Another beautiful thing about this design that the UIC has made is that the ministers of government are not politicians. They are not persons who are elected in the House or persons who are elected in the Senate. They are going to be persons who are subject matter expert. So if you're going to be National Security Minister, you must be an expert in the matter of national security. You follow me? Um, I don't know what just happened here, but let me fix that. So you must be a you must be an expert in the area that you're going to be a minister for. You must therefore be nominated. The president now won't have a free hand to just simply 
appoint you and fire you. No. In our system, the president has to consult with the three vice presidents and with the general secretary and with the treasury secretary and then put forward a person as a nominee to the Senate, the 14-member Senate, and say, we believe that this person is qualified and competent to serve in the office as minister of whatever, national security, education, health, whatever it is. And the Senate now, without having any special favors owing to the president, without having any way of having to worry that the president can do something bad to them if they don't do what he wants, they can now freely, openly, and publicly vet this person, look over their resume, look into their background, ask them public questions and verify what process are on the matters in question. And then the Senate would make a decision at the end to recommend to the House of Representatives to vote for this person to serve as Minister of National Security or Health or Education or whatever. When it comes to the House of Representatives now, they, representing the, the interest of their communities, will look at the recommendation of the senators. They would have witnessed the, the, um, the vetting of the senators. They would have listened to the president's argument for why he thinks this person is qualified. And then they now will vote yes or no to the recommendation of the Senate to put this person through or not. Once this person is appointed, they cannot be removed unilaterally by the president or the core executive. They have to go through the same process of being removed or replaced by somebody else. This will ensure that we have solid persons in place and that we have continuity that will transcend any given presidential term or any given vice presidential term because these persons would have been properly vetted and they don't leave office because their party lost the election, like we have now. So let's say today we had a good finance minister, which we don't. But let's, for argument's sake, say Mr. Clark was a good finance minister. If in the next election the UIC wins, Mr. Clark would have to leave because of the current system, and the UIC would put in their own. But let's say we had the UIC system in place, and we had an election and um, we changed the president, and we changed maybe one or two of the vice president, and maybe we changed some of the senators. But, we, but, they, but they, they minister for finance, the people them love the person there. Then that person would have stayed because the House of Representatives would find no reason to make a change on, on that. So there you have it, folks. This is the system that the UIC wants to give us, a system that will protect the rights and freedoms of all, of all Jamaicans, a system that would ensure that the interest of Jamaica is fully protected by these checks and balances. But there's more. Um, I think Douglas did walk you through this chart, which shows what's happening today. So today, in the system we have today, at the very top, you have the colonial masters. They are the ones who are pulling the global strings. They are the puppet masters at the top, right? Um, they establish the global rules, and then they enrich themselves working through the governments of the different countries. Now, in each of those countries, Jamaica not accepted, they also have a subset called the private sector organization of Jamaica in this case. And that subset has some leading powerful figures that make up the oligarchy who then control the two parties. And how do they control the two parties? By funding their campaigns. So in the last election, $300 million they gave to the two, plus millions more before the campaign. So, so the PNP and GLP are working exclusively for the PSOJ oligarchy, as well as the colonial masters. You see the arrows as they move? So the colonial masters influence the two parties by giving them certain benefits, for example, grants um, and loans. And if, they don't, and if they don't make laws and policies that are satisfactory to the colonial masters, then they withdrew, they will withdraw those grants and loans or you know, make it difficult to access them. Likewise, it's okay. If
SOJ oligarch and on behalf of the colonial masters. For example, during the last pandemic issue, the colonial masters gave billions of dollars to the mainstream media through their political machinery, the government that they and say, listen, tell the people this and don't tell the people that. And and block anybody who wants to tell the people this. And so the mainstream media works on behalf of the colonial masters and work on behalf of the PSOJ oligarchy and by extension work in collusion with the two control the political parties and together all of them even impacting social media as you saw uh, you know censoring people on social media and so on all of them together now work against the people of Jamaica dividing us distracting us deceiving us with the false or fake option of so-called government versus opposition and at the end of the day we the people think we're voting for options when no the options have been prepared for us which means there are no options at all when you vote jlp you're voting for the psoj oligarchy and the colonial masters when you vote pnp you're voting for the psoj oligarchy and the colonial masters the only way you can vote for yourself and Jamaica is by voting for the UIC because we're the only political party in Jamaica, the only movement which is here fighting for your rights and freedom and for you to have a system of governance that actually works for you and not work for the special interests who controls our banking system, our overall economy, our government, our education system, and our health care. The time has come for us, a different choice. And uh, Mr. Harper, I know that was a very long dissertation, so I will hand over to you now. No, that was great. A great explanation of what was said um, earlier. Um, I hope I hope everyone really understands um, all the UIC's position on this and understands where we want to go, where we want to take Jamaica, um, because this is this is revolutionary as far as i'm concerned um no one none of the other two parties have even come close to hinting well maybe they might have hinted at re um republic but i mean outside of that they've, they've never even come close to what we're what we're proposing and the plans that we have so um we are we are really looking forward to um, you guys just coming coming on board and helping us get the word out and spreading and sharing the word. Um, remember to like the video, guys, or like the live. Um, share as much as possible. And, of course, we see your comments, and we love to, to, to have your comments on the show. Uh, Lily's asking, when is the next general election? I'm All not right. sure. The, the, way, the way our electoral system works, um, after every election, the next election is due no later than five years after that. So they have a, a set date for the maximum amount of time you can go before the next election. Well, if you must have an election within five years of the last election. Now, that is 2025. But here's the confusion. The prime minister has the power to decide when to call the next election unilaterally. Right? So that's the bad system we have. In a UIC system, election dates will be fixed. The Prime Minister today promised us that within the first 100 days, he is going to establish fixed elections. He has now been in office for, what, seven years? So I guess him can't account. Him have account for the first 100 days. So we, we, the UIC, will tell you plainly, in our system, no leader will get to tell you when election is going to be called. That will be mandated in the Constitution as a standard fixed date. So as of now, the Prime Minister can call any call election anytime between now and 2025. 
What it means, though, is if we decide to rise up, rise up and demand an election, we can force the prime minister to call it no anytime we want. Ultimately, you know, we don't realize our power. The Constitution doesn't give us a lot of power, but we don't derive our power from the Constitution given to us by our colonial masters. Our power, <clears throat> our power <clears throat> resides in us. We, the people, deciding what we want. That is the power. And the moment we decide to decide what we want, then we will exercise that power. The UIC is trying to bring us there. Amen. <laughs> uh, so, uh, comment here. The best party ever. People, open your eyes and look carefully. This party will and must run the country. Don't be fooled by the other parties. They're fake, just like the news. Exactly. I agree. Is that Patrick? Well said, Patrick. Well said. Uh, Alan Scott saying... Oh, go ahead. Um, yes, family. Desmond. Yes, family. Like and share. Spread the message. The more the merrier. Everyone in Jamaica needs to know about the UIC. Definitely. Get on board. Get on board. We need the Jamaica we need, the Jamaica we deserve. UIC is the game changer. Yes, so we are coming to the end of our, of our show. Are there any other questions for Mr. Patterson? Um, okay, 20 Kevron has a question. Why is PSOJ against the people? Oh, can I, uh, forgive me, Mr. Harper, can I answer that one? <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, um, put it back on screen for me. If um, yeah, I don't know. It's a very important question. Why is the PSOJ against the people of Jamaica? Okay, the PSOJ is a special interest group. They're not necessarily against the people of Jamaica. They have an interest and their interest is not aligned with the interest of all Jamaicans. Uh, in any country, in any society, you will have um, persons with different interests. And if you allow them to get away with their interests, they will destroy you because they don't care about how what they, how what they want will affect you. That is why you need government. You see, the reason you need government in a society, right, is because you have to worry about two sets of people in any society. Uh, so let's say you're on, a, you're on an island, a little island somewhere out there in the ocean. Nobody knows you're there. There's no nearby country, no nearby island. And you're by yourself, just you. You need no government because you're the government. You decide everything. You decide when you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed, what will you eat. So the only thing that affects you now is nature. So you have to fight with nature to make sure, okay, how do I get a roof over my head? Where do I find food on the island? Um, what will I spend my day doing to protect myself? Now, let's say you have a family with you, your wife and some kids. Now it's a little bit more complicated because now you have to decide among your family how you're going to live on this island. What will your wife do? What will you do? For example, you decide you're going to be the hunter-gatherer. You're going to go out there and hunt for a wild pig and you're going to go and, 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 and gather some things and bring home, and your wife might cook it and take care of the family. Okay, great, complex. Let's say now you have one more family on the island. Now things get even more complicated. Which half of the island is mine? Which half is yours? You know, how will we deal with if you step over the line? Who decides what the line is? That's now where you need to, you know, come together now, a decision and, and, and plan it and whatever. Let's say you know 1,000 more families on the island. You see what I'm getting at, right? It's getting more complicated. That's why you have government. Now, with government, you give the government a certain role. One key role of government is to say, listen, government, we want you to put in place a police system that says, I can't go and thief my neighbor's carrots and cabbage and cattle, and him can't come and thief my, my pigs and my goats and my horse. The only way we can do this is if him come and offer me some of him stuff and me offer some of my stuff and we agree to trade and we're good. 
And we all agree that a portion of that will come to you now to be the police officer to make sure we behave ourselves and don't kill each other. And you, you work it out from there. So the role of government is to protect us from each other, to make sure that laws are in place and those laws are enforced to protect us from killing each other and to um, settle disputes. If you and I have a disagreement and I have to thump your name out or you lick me over my head with a stick, we go to a system called justice, a court, and we go through a process. Good. The, th the second thing now that government must do is if, if finally you discover there's, a, there's actually another island nearby, <laughs> Mr. Harper, there's another island nearby, and they want to come and thief our things and rape our women and take away our children and slaves. Government now has to put an army in place to protect the borders and prevent the other island people from coming and thiefing our things or killing us. So when you have good government, it ensures that you have a good system of justice and a good system of policing. And then it takes care of public infrastructure, like you know, the roads we're going to share, the parks and markets we're going to share, and so on. And it ensures that you have a good national security in terms of border controls to protect you from, from others. So the PSOJ is just one element of society that has too much power. We have not designed a system that would contain the PSOJ. We have designed a system that gives the PSOJ a disproportionate amount of power in that system. And they're using that disproportionate power to enrich themselves at the expense of the rest of us because we have failed to put in place a system of good governance. Now, the UIC recognizes this. Now, the two parties that have been, been in power for 78 years, they haven't recognized this. They have been in power for 78 years, and they have not seen this. Now, we, without your tax dollars, right? You never, you never give them the money. You never give us the money. We sat down and decided to think it through, look at different countries. I've been to the Netherlands. I've been to Cuba. I've been to China. I've been all over. I look at their system and said to myself, what is the best system we need to have in Jamaica in order for us to stop being exploited by everybody, by the Americans, by the British, by the PSOJ, by the Chinese, by anybody? We don't want nobody to keep exploiting us. Them trick us into slavery, demolished us, destroyed us mentally, took away our language, took away our culture, took away our history. We're nobody. They've, they've, they've destroyed us. So I said to myself, what can we do to regain control of our consciousness and our faculty and our culture and our heritage and be somebody again? What can we do? Well, it begins with a system of governance. We have to have a system that will allow us to bring out the best in our people. And that system must be a system that controls all the other elements so nobody will get to exploit nobody and the system is designed to allow everybody to achieve their maximum potential. And that's why we designed a nonpartisan constitutional republic that will unite us, that will empower us, and that will protect us so that we can be our best. Great answer, sir. <laughs> a long one as usual. And I'm sorry, I, forgive me for how long may I have to take for say this. But my half of first explain things so people can understand where we are come from. You understand? Definitely, definitely. All right. So a comment here from Zaith Zareth Neil. One important thing to mention is that no head of government under the UIC system can be a dictator like the current prime minister. That is so true. Absolutely. And and, um, and just to sorry again, just yeah. to make sure, and I won't be long this time, I promise you. Cross <laughs> my heart and hope to live. Uh, why, why Mr. Neal is saying that is that, you know, you have an independent Senate, so the Senate are controlled by, by the President. You have an independent House of Representatives. Every single member in the House can speak freely and vote freely because nobody can victimize him. Same for the Senators. And then even within the executive branch, you have three Vice Presidents that are independently elected that can talk to the President strong and firm and and defend the cause of the, their different counties. And the president has two running mates who would have also helped to formulate policies and ideas with him or her. So a beautiful system we have spent the time to design here. OK, 
okay, what is the possibility of UIC calling the PM to a debate? Well, we can call him all he wants, but he doesn't have to I accept. Don't. Yes, I don't. As, long as, as long as he has the backing. You see, here's what the PM and the opposition leader are banking on. They are banking on the Jamaican people continuing to do what they have always done and what they have been trained to do. Exactly. Not to get involved in the political process beyond voting. They're right. hoping that you just sit back and wait to vote. They're hoping that you will not volunteer, you will not donate, you will not join the UIC. Because if you don't do that, they know that we will not have the resources to effectively communicate. Remember, you know, them lock down the radio, them lock down the TV, them even try to lock down social media. So the only way the UIC can form government is if we, the people, become involved. If we decide that so we want to get involved, and we go and get involved and go and go door to door to door in our community, abroad or a yard. And we're going to donate and we're going to, to spread the word and we're going to share, share, share. If we decide to do that, then can I stop with? All right, next comment. The UIC is onto something real. And the fact that there are systems being put in place to censor the movement that should show everyone that the UIC is something. Well said, Vincenzo. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well Absolutely. They want to kill us. They want to make sure Jamaica doesn't have any options. They want to keep yes. it. Just the two of them. Just the and two. By just having the two of them, we the, listen, teachers, teachers can beg and ball all they want. As long as the PSOJ oligarchs know. Say, whether you vote PNP, you now nah get nothing. If you vote GLP, you, what did the GLP do? When they wanted to win, they promised you 1.5 million tax free. Remember that? Yep. 1.5 million tax free. And everybody got excited. I told them, I said, no, don't get excited. The They're going to give you one hand and they're going to take it back with the next one. As soon as they gave that the 1.5 million, they went and take it back with the, the gas tax. They raised the gas tax. Okay? And now see inflation wipe out the 1.5. The 1.5 is barely worth five. You understand? So, so there is no way, no way on God's creation that you can trust any one of them. Don't allow yourself to be fooled the, the, the what the 79th time? It's, <laughs> it's, 70, it's 78 years already, you know. So the 79th year is now. The next year coming, it's going to be 79. Don't allow them to fool you. On March 22nd of, sorry, what month, March? On September 22nd, September 22nd, that's next month, September 22nd, I want you to join me again, out at Ward Day Park again. This time, we're walking for good governance. We're demanding that the government stop playing Mickey Mouse with our lives and let us settle the matter of good governance now. Back to you, sir. Yes, sir. Question from uh, 20 Kevron. Will you pardon the people who are in prison for nonviolent crimes like who sold marijuana or cocaine? Absolutely. A resounding yes. We, we are not in the business of um, incarcerating people for victimless crimes. Um, if you decide to smoke weed, that is your choice. If you decide to sell weed, that is your choice. You understand? If, on the other hand, you... Um, infringed upon somebody's rights, their life, their liberty, or their property, then of course we're going to deal with you for that. Uh, because we are 100%, 100% opposed to anybody using force or fraud to violate the life, the liberty, or property rights of others. But if you want to eat ganja, drink ganja, or smoke ganja, that is your choice. Just make sure when you don't smoke it or drink it or eat it, you don't go trouble nobody. Uh, Joya says, there's a choice. Vote UIC or continue our march into slavery. Yes, Absolutely. and that's a serious thing. I mean, Absolutely. If, if you see what's happening now, I mean, that's really where we're going. That's exactly where we're heading to. Uh, Another question here. What happens to the parish council election? Oh, 
Okay. Parish Council election to call. So that one was delayed by another one year. You know, they, they delayed it yeah. before. So the next one, the next maximum date that they have set, the last maximum date they violated it, uh, they were to call it last year and they, well, early this year, February this year, they violated it. Uh, that was the, the law said it should have been called before that and they violated it. So the next date that they have set now is March, sorry, February of 2023. The Prime Minister again can call that any time. Now what they do with this, you know, when they do it this way, they are able to then manipulate manipulate society because the the opposing party can't know how to prepare, when to prepare for, how to so you're always on edge. So they have designed this deliberately to deliberately. give the sitting government this kind of power over the exactly. people, you know, a power which is unwarranted, unnecessary, unneeded. They have created this false system of governance, false system of democracy, because this is not democracy, by the way. It's not. This is dictatorship disguised as democracy. Now, just so I am clear, I don't like democracy. I do not like what people think of as democracy, where you have the majority rule. I don't believe in majority rule. I believe in protecting the rights of every person. So you must use democratic elections to decide issues that are not about my rights and freedom. So for example, issues concerning which, which side of the road you drive on, whether we use red and green and yellow for the lights, which for street signs for um, public transit system, we can vote on those things. But your rights, your personal rights and freedom, those are eternal. They're God-given. Nobody should decide whether you have a right to your freedom of speech, your freedom of movement, your freedom of association, or your freedom of choice. Nobody should make a decision about what goes into your body. That is, you, your body is your most sacred property. This body of yours if nothing else, if you have nothing else in this world, your body is your body. Nobody now have no business to want to try to decide what they want to inject into your body. No matter how bright they are, no matter how, how brilliant they are, no matter how much billions they have, they have no right to seek to take away your right to choose what goes into your body. And you must choose that. So the UIC comes at this. All of our policies are based at respecting and protecting your rights and freedom as an individual. And any government which needs to take away your right in order to protect you is a government you cannot trust. I believe the government must be able to encourage, they must be able to influence, they must be able to um, convince you that what they're provide, proposing to you concerning your rights is good. They must not be able to force you in those areas. Back to you, yeah. Mr. Harper. All right, so a question here from Rhythm Life. How do you feel about the electric vehicle being introduced? Well, thank you for that very light question. It's a <laughs> nice, uh, you know, it's a <laughs> um, Well... <laughs> I know sometimes I think we make fuss about the wrong things, you see? Uh, but for electric vehicles, I think it's lovely that we have inventors in the world who are inventing new things that we can use. Um, I am more interested, though, in making sure that you have that right to produce that new thing and that nobody is trying to, um, for example, limit you while they have the right to produce that something. So whether it's an electric vehicle or a shaver or a bicycle or a scooter, what I want is for the Jamaican people to start producing these things and stop just consuming them. I want us to have a government that empowers us to produce, to create, to invent, to innovate. For example, if the UIC has its way, okay, we're going to be the next Netherlands in the world. When it comes down to food production did you know that the netherlands which has only 17 million people is one of the smallest countries in europe 
is the second largest exporter of food in the entire world. They don't even have the beautiful weather that we have 12 months a year. They have it only for a few months out of the year. And yet still, they have been able to produce 95 billion euros worth of farm export every year. Second only to the United States, which has over 300 and what, 30 million people. They're second only to the United States. We are right next door to the United States. We have a land mass that can hold 70 million people, believe it or not. You didn't, but Jamaica, our land mass can hold 70 million people. Okay, you can do the math. Singapore is the size of St. Thomas, smaller than St. Thomas, and they have 5.5 million people. Multiply that by 15 and see how much we can hold in here. Now, listen to me. Just imagine if we had the leadership like what they had in the Netherlands back in the 1960s and 70s. Leadership that led that country to become a farming giant and make farming a major part of their economic infrastructure and is able to be the second larger produ largest producer of food for the world. And guess what? They figured out how to, long before many countries, how to produce with using less and less pesticide and herbicides that are bad for us. Okay? Now, the UIC, we're going to make Jamaica the organic food capital of the world. How? We're going to introduce the same technologies and better. We're going to train our people the same way and better. We're going to build the industries the same way and better than the Netherlands so that Jamaica becomes the largest producer of organic foods for the rest of the world. And that will give us the kind of economic edge we need to stop being dependent on imports and or at least stop having the value for dollar depreciate because our exports will now be greater than our imports for the first time since these um, middlemen have taken over the government of Jamaica. Yes. Uh, Alan Scott says, electric train, Portland to Negril, no more junk. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, some good high speed rails. Good high yes. speed. Uh, I'll give you another example, Douglas. I spoke about it the other night. We have these big mud lakes in Jamaica, you know, the, where after they dump the bauxite um, poison, when they take the poison, yes. you know, they have, they have, they have rid the earth, earth of all there. of its nutrients and made it poisonous. And they make these huge mud lakes. And our politicians, our political leadership have sat here for years upon years upon years and not cover that mud lake with, with solar farms so at least we can be generating energy from that large amount of land which is now useless. Instead, what are they doing? Creating more useless lands by keeping bauxite mining going to the point where they're poisoning our rivers and will soon destroy our water table so that Jamaica will become a country that has to import water because they would have poisoned our water source. What a wicked set. What a wicked set. J Singapore, no, Singapore has no water. Singapore has to be importing water. And they've come up with desalination plants to harvest water from the ocean. And they're very brilliant people. With nothing, they have made themselves one of the richest countries in the world. We have everything, Douglas. We have everything here. We, yeah. we could have been Singapore a hundred times over. But we have these anemic leaders who all they can do is focus on winning elections. One after the other, the bet who have the better dub plate, who have the better clocks, who have the better hairdo, or who have the better fashion, or who has the prettiest girls on them team. What kind of foolishness is this? While yeah. our country is wasting away, wasting away, we and becoming a dunce country. Yeah. The country I get dunce because all of our bright people are migrate and we're and we're failing 70% of our students every year from high school. So we're building a big dunce country. Yeah. And then we talk oh, about, the, the PM talks about um, the, the politics of poverty. <laughs> it's yeah, uh, yeah. it's crazy. All right. So 20 Kevron has a question. Um, many Jamaicans overseas would like to start businesses, but it costs three times whatever you paid for it at customs. What can UIC do when elected? 
Excellent question, Kevron. You probably didn't know this, but the UIC plan is to get rid of the import duties. We're going to have the 10% tax. When you're bringing something in, you get the 10% on it like you do with any other products and services. So, or especially when it comes down to the things you need to compete, we don't believe in taxing, um, uh, putting you know excessive duties on things that we don't produce here in Jamaica. So you need to have access to technology. You need to have access to all the implements you need to compete with the other countries. So if we block you by making it expensive for you to... I'll tell you something. If you're running a manufacturing plant in Jamaica, just by buying the piece of equipment, you lose already. Because your, compet your competition, he has it for, let's say, 50,000 US dollars. When you buy it, you have to pay 75,000 US dollars for it. So you're already at a loss. So you cannot produce at a price point that will be competitive to the to the Chinese product already. They lose already. So you, that's why our manufacturers are not going anywhere. Our energy cost is too high. Our importation cost is too high. Our labor force is too weak. You see what I'm saying? So the UIC is going to address all of these basic things by doing what is right for Jamaica instead of what is right for the PSOJ. All right, so... Christopher is asking, what is your policy pertaining to public health and sanitation? Right. Uh, excellent. So, as you know, the UIC is committed to creating a safe, clean, and orderly Jamaica. Um, so we want to make sure that Jamaica is very clean. Uh, so public health, your entire environment, all of Jamaica must be cleaned up. Not these one-off token things like we're going to fix up the Mandela Highway today, we're going to debush the dike road one day. We're going to have Christmas walk and we're going to chop out some area. No. The, or we have a, we suddenly have a flood and then that's when we remember we need to clean drains. The UIC is going to have a public works department that is hired and tasked with maintaining the country 24-7. So every day road are clean. Every day drain are clean. Every day sidewalk is being properly maintained. So you have beautiful flowers, nice grass. The whole Jamaica is going to look like a tourist resort, east to west, north to south. And of course, when it comes down to public health, we believe in preventative. So our education system must teach our children how to take care of themselves and their environment from day one. And our public health inspectors must enforce these things on a daily basis around the country to make sure that we don't have anything building up. So we're not gonna be caught off guard by stuff happening. And then you say to me, how are we going to pay for all of that? Very simple. We lose 750 million US dollars every year, or 113 billion dollars every year from corruption. So by simply putting in our system of governance, we're going to save 113 billion dollars every year from going into the pockets of people who are thieves and criminals masquerading with ties and jackets. Uh, will Jamaica going, is Jamaica going to have free education when you're in power? Uh, no, Jamaica doesn't have and never will have and cannot have free education. Education must be paid for by somebody. In the current system, what you have is um, a monopoly education, which is classified as free education. It's a system that allows the government to collude with our foreign masters and the PSOJ to miseducate, undereducate, and depreciate the Jamaican people. What you want instead is an education system that fully empowers the Jamaican people to get the best quality education at every stage of life, especially at the basic school, primary, and secondary level, in order for them to be able to do well at the tertiary and technical uh, levels. So our model of education is very different. We don't call it free. What we do is to make sure that every child, regardless of their family's income, will be able to access every level of education up to the PhD level. But we will never call it free. Calling anything free is a mind-numbing, mind-degrading approach. We are destroying the minds of our people by talking about free anything. We must tell our people we have to work and pay for what we want. We need a culture of production, a culture of productivity, a culture of no longer looking for handouts or looking for freebies, a culture where we produce, earn, and enjoy a good quality living. So nothing more free. No free education, no free health care. Instead, we're going to make sure every child receives quality education, 
quality health care, quality housing, and of course, um, a quality Jamaica. Yes, and to uh, Shand Ellis says, what we really need to do is dash away that colonial educational curriculum and revamp a brand new system for our people. And that's part of our um, educational plan, um, part of our LEAP program, Learning Enrichment Advancement, Advanced Program, sorry. Um, yeah. Three of the pillars is, is um, knowing self, understanding self, understanding mm -hmm. how to relate to people. That's the second pillar. And the third pillar is understanding money. But all of that is, is, is undergirthed with an, uh, an Afrocentric um, education program. Absolutely. Uh, and when you're done with our program, uh, in our education program, when we're finished with the student, uh, they're going to be augmenting every area of her life. Just think of a child who understands how their body works. Um, Harper, um, you, you know exactly what you should eat, when you should eat, how you should eat, if yeah. you want your body to function at a Usain Bolt level, for example, right? And um, you will understand how your mind works and how to optimize your mind, how to use as much of your brain power as possible for the good of mankind. Um, you will understand how you, you'll understand human behavior. So when you see your friend or your parent or a stranger behaving a certain way, you understand how to interpret that, how to interpret the body language and how to approach them to diffuse the situation, how to handle conflicts and so on. Just imagine if that's the focus of our school, preparing our children to be great human beings, exceptional citizens, not just a cog in a wheel, not just a labor force person, not just a laborer, mm. not just an employee, but a human being, a person who has, has developed their faculty of thinking and reasoning and, and analysis to be able to be a, a very, very intelligent and productive part of society. I'm, I'm, I can't wait for us to put this in place so that we can start seeing the kind of Jamaicans that we want to see in this country. Not people who cuss at every last, you know, every little thing that happened and going cuss and go on bad and tell all kind of words. No, man. We want a different Jamaica. We want a Jamaica, and some people may not like this, you know, but I don't care. I want a Jamaica of highly intelligent, highly informed, highly educated people that can hold their own anywhere around the world at various levels in complex and difficult um, situations, calculus, you know, um, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, uh, all these areas, we want to bring out that, that human development and human capital. And it's too late. It's too late for the two parties to start talking this language. It's too late. We don't want to hear no, that them coming now. They're going to do it you know, tomorrow morning. Yeah. You're going to hear them. Human capital, AI, robotics, whatever. Tomorrow, you'll hear them. I see you now, I saw, what's her name? Malihu Ford. That's her name? Mm -hmm. Today or day before yesterday, talking now about, oh, I... I dream of a, a cleaner Jamaica. Yes, that's where right. Yes. Oh, come on. For Christ's sake. Where were you before? We, I, uh, I just know you realize that Jamaica dotty. Yes. Is just just now you realize that the country dotty because the yeah. UIC is pushing it now? Come on, man. Come on. P.J. Patterson had this country for 18 and a half years. I want him to leave office. He talked about values and attitudes, but where do you go? What kind of values? Attitudes did he pass on to the Jamaican people? Bruce Golding, will he put a big chat with the NDM? When he was elected, what him do? Him get caught with him hand in the same cooking same thing that he told us was bad. So them now have no more opportunity. I'm being very serious here. Any Jamaican who fall for this lie again, any Jamaican who fall for this lie again and allow the JLP and PNP to get away with lying to them again, with sweet talks, with nice advertisement. You will deserve the Jamaica that you get after that. Sorry, I'm getting heated now. Back to you. <laughs> well, here's one that is it's going to be a, another heated one. How do you reform the banking system with their restrictive KYC oh. central oh. bank digital currencies? <laughs> Oh boy, you guys are gonna kill me. Where tonight. do we start? <laughs> you know, where do we start? Oh, by the way, okay, very simple. 
the UIC will be taking Jamaica out of the fraudulent banking system. We are leaving that system. So um, let's put everybody on notice. All of you on the board of the Bank of Jamaica, all of you who currently are running the banking system cartel in Jamaica, and you overseas, the global masters who are happy to have Jamaica as one more pawn in its system of monetary fraud, the, the, the UIC Jamaica, the new Jamaica, will be leaving that fraudulent system. We are going to have free banking in Jamaica. We are going to have a banking system that is open and transparent, where the focus is on serving the Jamaican people. We're going to have a banking system where having a bank account is a right, not a privilege. We're going to have a banking system in Jamaica that is highly competitive, we're going to have a banking system in Jamaica which only uses real money. So no more will you be will you have your hard earnings losing its value. So if you earn a hundred thousand dollars this year, 2022, if the UIC is elected, come 2050, that one hundred thousand dollars is still worth one hundred thousand dollars. Let me say it again: that one hundred thousand dollars, whatever it can buy today it will be able to buy 50, 30, or 40 years down the road because we are going to have a real money system. Not the fake fiat currency money, real money in Jamaica, backed by the productivity of the Jamaican people. We're no longer going to have a so-called central bank that is working on behalf of private interest. We're not going to have a central bank that's in the hands of private interests. We're going to have a central bank that is in the hands of the Jamaican people via their government. And the purpose of that bank is one simple purpose, to make sure that there is no fraud or force in the banking system and to ensure that you have money which is backed by productivity and is not manipulatable by the government or by any other special interest. Yep. Okay, uh, good question here. Uh, will Andrew Holness be arrested <laughs> when the UIC gets elected? <laughs> well, um, if he has done if he has done anything, if he is found to be guilty of any form of theft or fraud, then of course he's going to be arrested and charged, and that goes for all of us. All any of one us. of us. Any one of us in the new Jamaica, self-included, that is found to be um, to have engaged in fraud or theft, you will pay the price. But we're going to have particular interest in the political class and the private sector elite class. We're going to have a special interest to know if they have engaged in any fraud as it relates to the monies of the people of Jamaica or tax dollars. We're going to check them out carefully. All right? Yes, All right. go ahead. So, question here. How will public transportation be structured and paid for? It has a direct relationship to public order. Beautiful question, Christopher M. Uh, public transportation has a special place in my heart because I want us to have a public transit system which is reliable, and accessible to all Jamaicans all across Jamaica. So you're talking about connecting all of our communities, all of our towns and our cities across all 14 parishes with a very fluid transportation system uh, that works for everyone. So we're going to have a nationalized um, transportation system. Uh, it's going to be owned and operated by the government on behalf of the Jamaican people uh, with all of our existing operators, when we take office, all of them will be given a chance to have an equal share based on the size of their fleet in the, the infrastructure. And then we're going to have it all connected algorithmically so that wherever you are, you take up your cell phone and you say, I am right now in, um, let's say, Bethel Town in West Milan, and I want to go to Kingston in the morning. And you go on your phone and you put in when you want to leave home and when you want to get to Kingston and it will plot for you the route and everything so you can get there in the, the shortest possible time. And when you walk to each of the stops, 
the bus will be there for you based on the time slots. So we're going to have, for simplicity, I'm saying it in simple form now, you're going to have um, designated vehicles on different routes. They're not going to wait until they fill up. They're going to be required to be at the different points in the data within a five minute you the computer will be able to pinpoint when is coming. Secondary is nice. All right, it seems as if Mr. Patterson has frozen. Yes. I think I lost connection here. Am I back with you guys? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You can hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you now. Wonderful. So yes, yeah, so we're going to have clean buses, clean taxis, clean minivans, and they're going to be linked. It's going to be run on a very different model. I don't even want to get into the details of the, the financial model because our good friends are going to borrow it and they're not going to do it right and they're going to mess it up and then tell you it can't work. So let us just say the UIC is going to ensure you have a public transit system that is accessible, to all Jamaicans right across Jamaica, and it will be on a digital platform that guarantees that you're going to get within five minutes at the specific designations that you want it. Okay? It's a very new system. Thank um, you. Misha, Misha Earl is asking, um, why, why nationalize, let me bring it up. Oops, that was the wrong one. Why nationalize the system? Right? Why not leave it to the... The free market. Free market. Yeah, because you can't do that. They, I've looked at it very closely. Um, you cannot, if you, if you have a, you know, the way free market works, you need to have, you need to have um, enough buyers and sellers in the market to be able to have a completely free market uh, system. So if you think about transportation, right now what you have is semi-free market, which is really brutal. It's not, not because it's a free market, but because of the, the whole way. So what you have, let's say you had it, let's say you had free markets. They said, okay, free market, anybody can do whatever they want with the busing services or taxis. What you're going to have is every taxi man is going to drive as fast as he can to get as many people as he can to get as fast as he can to the next point in order to make a money. Now, for him, that is fine, uh, but it puts your life at risk and it's very inefficient for the users because the users can't predict what is going on. They don't know when is what, and they just suffer. Similarly, the boss has to make sure he loads properly. Why does he have to load, load before he leaves? If he leaves too soon with only 10 people in the bus, he's going to lose money. So he has to pack it up first. Now, the, let's say you had six buses on the route, but you only needed three based on the, the volume of citizens in that area, you end up with six buses, and then they all go and try to beat each other within this, within this limited capacity environment. So it doesn't work. In a larger, larger environment, like say Canada, you can do that, but then you're going to give each of those zones to one private en entity, which you can do. The problem with that is, is that who selects who the private entity will be? The politicians, right? They're going to select which, so they have to decide between there are six people who want to offer the service and somebody gets to say, which of the six of you are going to give the route to? You understand? So now corruption is going to creep in because somebody will have to do something to make sure that they are the one, the one of the six that is selected. But suppose you have a national bus service, which includes taxi and everybody, whatever the links you have there. What you have now is the focus is now on the customer. So you shift away from the competition to the customer, getting to where they want to get. And now all of the other persons simply are 
part owners of a system and don't have to worry about, I have to keep my bus here and full it first. All the buses, instead of having six, we'll have three because we don't need six based on the population size. And they will now follow the timetable. And that will make sure that you have the right amount of buses at the right time for the people in it. Long story short, that's it. Thank you. All right. So I think this would be our last question. How can we be sure this is not all a bait and switch? Very good question. Read in Very life. Question. You, you can't be sure. Um, life is not that beautiful where you get to be absolutely sure about anything. So when you're going to select your course of study in university, are you sure that you're going to get the job when you finish? No. Um, when you're going to select your wife, are you sure she's going to be the best wife? No. So you have to use your judgment. So you use your best judgment to say, which of these two beautiful young ladies will I marry? If you're lucky to have that choice. Maybe it's the other way around. Um, you know, <laughs> which of these two young men will I marry? But the bottom line is, life is a, is a thing of judgment. You have to reason, rationalize, and make a decision. Same thing with the UIC. So here's where, here's where you are, Rhythm. You have a simple situation in front of you, which is complex at the same time. You have three basic options in front of you. Option one, you vote for the PNP or the GLP, but you know that based on probability, it is highly likely that you're going to get the same results you have gotten since they've shown you them, themselves for 78 years. So you know what you're going to get because you've seen how they have performed for the last 78 years. That's option one, JLP or PNP. Option two is not to vote at all, don't get involved, just say I'm done with it. Fine. You know what to expect from that as well. If you don't, if you do that, if you don't vote and don't get involved, you're going to end up likely with one of those two again. And therefore, you know the likely outcome. The probability is on a scale of um, 1 to 100. It's a 99% chance you're going to get more of what you've gotten before. And it's going to be even worse, right? Because every year it gets worse. Look at the dollar. The longer we keep them, the dollar goes down. The longer we keep them, crime goes up. The longer we keep them, more Jamaicans leave, right? So that's a given. Your third option now is to try something different. You have no idea if that something different is going to be any better. But the probability of it being different is very high because you have never seen us perform before. So if I were you, I would bet on something which has a 50-50 chance of giving me something better than bet on something that has a 99% chance of giving me something just as bad as I had before. Your call. Next question or comment. Uh, apparently, Renault Productions doesn't think that we're answering real questions. I don't know which. Would you oh, ask a question, Renault? Um, well, <laughs> we'd, we'd like to answer any question that you have. Yes. Um, there was someone that said that was asking about. Where is it? Oh, um, all right. Here we are. Maurice Williams. Um, are we going to have our own airplane again? <laughs> okay, that's an good. Question. That's an interesting question. Um, the, the answer you'd like to hear, Maurice Williams, is yes. Um, the answer is I don't know because that will be a decision made by the Jamaican people. What the UIC is going to do, and I, I, I like what, what Misha is saying, and Misha, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the public transportation system we can talk i want us to have a debate a discussion um where we where we talk about some of these issues right so we can hear from other sides maybe you have a great idea of how they for example we can have a successful market economy around public transit great for the airplane i believe we can and um it may be a good idea too but not in the same way we had it before uh we have to be very careful that we don't just do things that then the people pay for like you know the, the what we had before as a airline was something that was losing money every single solitary year after the jamaican government took it over when the colonial powers had it it was making money it's just amazing and then they gave it to our politician and it started to lose money every single year after that uh so 
I want to be very careful about how many things we take on and say government owns. We, the people, can own it. Like, for example, there are persons right now in Jamaica who are running private airlines, smaller, but private airlines. In the new Jamaica that we create, maybe those persons can, because of us, be empowered to expand their fleet and expand their ownership base to many more Jamaicans. And so you have Air Jamaica again, but it doesn't mean Air Jamaica run by the government. It means Air Jamaica, one of our great Jamaicans, have built an airline that is very successful and it has, you know, 50,000 shareholders or 100,000 Jamaicans. So we're not just trying to to take things on to say the government again has it. It's really to, to, to create a Jamaica that is enabling, that is empowering, that helps you, the people, to create things. I want you to own schools. I want you to own hospitals. I want you to own clinics. I want you, I don't want to be this, this God that we, we come and take over and we own everything now and we decide. No, I want to have many Jamaicans now becoming owners of many things. Buses, planes, cargo ships, um, digital companies, uh, AI technology companies, um, coding companies, you know, all kinds of different companies. I want to see the 2.9 million people here feeling powerful to be individuals in their own country that can succeed to the nth degree because we finally have a government that is about we the people as opposed to them the government and them friend who back them yep definitely and as Sean Ellis says we need to be known we need to be known for something other than being runners and entertainers <laughs> and <current> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely as a matter of fact um Sean Ellis I want us to be known as the country that finally showed, showed the world what good governance looks like I want us to do, we're going to get one up on Singapore. You see, Singapore has done some really good thing, you know, but the truth is they don't have the best system of governance. They have, they have just done some things very, very well. We have designed the best system. We have now found the perfect balance between the rich and the poor, a system that gives the rich no advantage over them through the government and doesn't make the poor a drag on the rest of the country by giving the poor the right to vote for themselves, free stuff, and then destroy the economy. So we've created a system that balances all of that. So the poor now is going to be made rich or richer because now in the new Jamaica, all Jamaicans become property owner. So you're no longer property less. In the new Jamaica, every child's nutrition will be, will be keen. We're going to look at the nutrition. So proper nutrition for every child. Uh, proper education up to the PhD level. And, and be careful when I say that. I don't mean every child will be at the PhD level. We're going to make sure that any child that can make it up to the, that level by their own performance, they won't be stopped because they didn't have the money. You understand? So we're going to make sure if, you, if a child can become a neuroscientist or an astrophysicist or whatever it is, the system doesn't stop them just because they happen to be born to a mother or a father without the means. So we're going to make sure every child has the opportunity to be their full self. Uh, and also, every child has a decent home to grow up in. No more child must grow up the way I did in this little one box room with bed and everything at night. And, you, you know, it's just so cramped and whatever. And outside bathroom. And a, you know, we want to get rid of all of that. So we are going to make sure that every child gets the quality education they need to succeed, the healthcare they need to succeed, the nutrition they need to succeed, the housing they need to succeed. And we're going to create a Jamaica that is highly conducive for the Jamaican people to succeed. So good roads, streets. Right now, the Prime Minister, by the way, the man Tifa, you is now talking about how, how come we don't have street names and everybody having fixed address. How on, Mr. Harper, how on earth do these politicians sit down for 78 years and don't make sure every Jamaican has a street address? And now that the UIC is pushing it, now him going go up there and talk about it, like say, is him just discovered this. Well, not just, like, you know, he's, he's taking the position of 
oh, we, we need to fix this because, no, you guys have failed the Jamaican people. Exactly. Every Jamaican should have had a fixed address by now. We're in the 21st century. There's no reason why you shouldn't have, my name is Joseph Patterson, and I live at 12 Everyday Road in this parish, in this section of the parish, with this code to find me. There's no reason why in 2022 we have a prime minister talking about the lack of fixed address as if in the responsible. You have been in politics for 25 years, more than 25 years, Mr. Hollis. Why didn't you bring this up when you were a, low, a lowly MP? Why didn't you bring this up when you were education minister? Why didn't you bring this up in your campaign in 2016? Why didn't you do it while you were prime minister for the last seven years? Why is it now everything the UIC has said, you go and order to tell people about it as if you're some great thinker? You're, anyways. Apparent. Listen, these guys are so despicable. If the Jamaican people allow them to win again, my goodness. Sorry, I'm losing it. But here's here what I'm saying here. There's no reason why you in St. Elizabeth, in Elam, should be telling people that your address is Mayor Brown, Elam District, St. Elizabeth. That's not an address. You should be saying, my name is Mayor Brown. I live at um, Marcus Garvey Circle, at, and the number for that is 21. And this is in Northeast St. Elizabeth, um, postal code 123456. Yeah? And so when you go up online and you buy your, your something now, you put in your full address and it just deliver it right to your house. When you get your mail, it just deliver right to your house. You don't have to go to a post office. Any mail for me? And the chef will go through the list and we'll see where is it. This is diabolical. This is sick. There's no reason why that should be the case right now. Me, I am running to become the next prime minister and next president of Jamaica. I may not have no fixed address. Me live in a book, St. Elizabeth. Right? Braze River Peel. What kind of foolish is that? Everybody that live near to me living in the same place. Uh, Bog, St. Elizabeth. Bog District, St. Elizabeth. Braze River Peel. We all live at the same place. All 40,000 away in the area live at, well, not 40, but in this case, uh, you know, uh, 16,000 live at the same area. Braze River Peel. No, sir. This can't be right. In, in be 2022, right. this is ridiculous. 2022. Them have this country for 78 years and we still don't have a fixed address. So question is, will you be marching to Gordon House in September 2022? Uh, September uh, we're, 2022. we're going to be marching uh, from, from Ward Theatre uh, 9 a.m. Uh, or is it 10? 10 a.m. Is it 9 or 10? 10 a.m. on September 22nd. We're going to be doing a good governance march from Ward Theatre downtown to Hero Circle, and from Hero Circle to Emancipation Park, from Emancipation Park to Half a Three, where we will then have a rally, and I'll give a speech and stuff like that. So it's going to be a lovely day, a very positive day. Nurses, teachers, doctors, police officers, workers from all walks of life, and I'll be making a big announcement on the day. I will make an announcement that will be totally revolutionary. We're going to announce a solution to the massive problem we're having in losing our teachers and losing our nurses. I'm going to unveil the UIC policy and how we can immediately stop the bleeding and get our people back to work and engage in their work and happy about their work because of the UIC policy, which I will unveil. And I'll ask the government to implement it immediately. So our teachers, our nurses, our doctors, our police officers, our firefighters and all our workers across all industries will finally have a system that is fair, equitable and just so that their economy can be back on track and they will not have to suffer from high prices, high inflation and devaluation because the UIC has taken the time to find a solution to our massive economic problem in terms of the earnings of our people and that will be announced on September 22nd um, in halfway tree. And final, this is the last question. <laughs> this is we, have <laughs> we have to go. We have to go. 
All right, so Mr. Patterson, what happened to the reparations that we were all promised? Will you get that for us? Uh, well, when, when you are beaten, and we must remember this, right? I know we have been trained by our leaders to be victims and to spend our days begging our, um, what you call them now, our conquerors. We've been pushed to, to learn to beg our conquerors to give us reparation and to beg our conquerors to look favorably upon us because of all the horrible things they have done to us. Men are joined the camp there. I am not in the begging business. The people them beat we, them conquer we. We failed. My ancestors failed to defend their freedoms. They failed to defend their lands. And by extension, they failed us who came after them. I'm not going to join them in failure and I'm not going to join them in begging. We must take control of ourselves, take control of our lands, take control of our assets and govern ourselves well and stop hoping and praying and begging for those who conquer us to have mercy upon us. I don't expect them to have mercy upon us. And if they give us $1 tomorrow, it will be quickly stolen by our politicians. If they were to give us reparations of 20 billion US dollars tomorrow, sure. we will not be better off a year after, five years after, or 20 years after, because we have not learned to govern ourselves. I want us to focus on governing ourselves well so that we can once again take control of our lands, take control of our resources, take control of our lives, and build a master economy because we did it. Not because we begged it, not because we were able to convince our conquerors to have mercy upon us, but because we realized we messed up, we failed, we were conquered, and it's time for us to now conquer. Amen. Well said, well said. So on that note, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming on live. I, we really appreciate you guys um, spending time out of your evening. And some of you guys are here every day, like um, JMH and Lion Rule the Jungle. Um, Alan Scott, also, I see you a lot. You know, So we really appreciate you guys coming on. Um, remember, guys, that we have a, a goal to get to 1,000 members paying 25 US dollars a month or donating 25 US dollars a month to the UIC. Also remember that we'll be having a march on the 22nd of September. Um, as Mr. Patterson said, we'll be walking from, from um, Ward Theater to Gordon House, from Gordon House to Emancipation Park and ending up um, in Halfway Tree. And uh, you're gonna hear more about that as well. So thanks guys. Um, Hope you have a great evening and thank you for tuning in. Uh, that's it. Thank, thank thanks, you, guys. everyone. Thank you, Harper. Take care. All the best. Take Talk care. Bye-bye.